It did not take long after the world was created for sin to enter the world and for the world to be cursed. Not only the world, but everything in it was cursed. The animals were cursed to live shorter lives. Women were cursed to bring forth children in pain. Kids could have simply slipped out without any pain, but now there was the curse. Men were cursed to work hard and to sweat for their food. The ground was cursed to grow thorns and thistles. People were cursed to be sick, to die, to return to dust. It has been a long process, but God has been working to remove all those curses. This morning in our text, we will see that in the future, all those curses will be removed. Soon people will see that finally the curse is gone. Please turn with me to Revelation chapter 22, verse 1, as we continue where we stopped last week. Chapter 22 has two simple parts, two final things. The final outcome in the first seven verses and the final message closing the whole book in the last 17 verses. Today we we'll take the first part, and after the holidays, we will conclude our study of the book of Revelation after 33 studies. John has been talking about new things, a new heaven, new earth, new city, new relationship with God, new living conditions. Then he showed us the place where we are going to live with God, an awesome place. Today, he continues and gives us more information about that new place. He will show us the final outcome. There will be several things missing, but the best one of all will be no more curse. It is important for us to remember and focus on the main subject, the main topic of this book, of Revelation, which is the Lord Jesus Christ. The book is called the Revelation of Jesus Christ, not the Revelation of John the Divine, as some Bibles say. People have the tendency to focus on the exciting events, the exciting creatures that they see, and the apocalypse all those things found in the book of Revelation. But this book is intended to focus on the person of Jesus Christ. As exciting as the future may look for us believers, still it is very important not to get away from the central focus, which is Jesus Christ. Looking at the future, looking at our new place, we see a day when we will finally say, finally the curse is gone. So John continues, he says here in verse 1, And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the middle of its street, and on either side of the river was the tree of life, which bore 12 fruits, each tree yielding its fruit every month. The leaves of the tree were for healing of the nations. So the first question is, who showed this river to John? For the answer, we must go back to chapter 21, verse 9. It is one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls filled with the seven last plagues. We will see him again in our next study. He will be rebuking John for attempting to worship him. We do not worship angels. 
In the previous chapter, John had talked about the city itself, its dimension, its foundation, its illumination, its protection with all the gates. This time, he will focus on the interior of the city. Now we are moving in. And the first thing the angel showed John was a pure river of water of life. And John tells us two things about that river. First, its condition. It is clear as crystal. The Greek word means simply clean. It is very clean. It's very clear. We do not have crystal clean rivers anymore. People have been polluting everything around them for centuries. Remember the commercial that they had on TV showing an American native man crying as he looked at all the garbage in the woods. After this condition, we have its conception, the source. Where does it come from? It is proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb. It is fitting that it proceeds from the throne of God because as Jesus said, nothing else will satisfy the soul. It is only as we have a relationship with God that we are really, truly satisfied people. Do not be confused with the river here because there are two other rivers mentioned in the Bible. There's one in Ezekiel 47. There's one in Zechariah 14. In Ezekiel, the river flows from the temple, not from the throne. In Zechariah, the river flows from Jerusalem, half flowing to the eastern sea, which is the Dead Sea, and half flowing to the western sea, which is the Mediterranean Sea. The river here in verse 1 will be part of the new Jerusalem in the new earth that God is going to create, new heaven, new earth. After the river, the second thing that John saw was a tree, tree of life, not a tree of life, but he clearly says the tree of life referring to one specific kind of tree. When God created Adam and Eve, he placed them in the Garden of Eden, and in that garden, there was many different kind of trees. Adam was commanded to eat from any trees in Genesis 2.16, except one, the tree of knowledge of good and evil in Genesis 2.17. There was also there the tree of life in Genesis 3.22. Both are in the singular form because there was only one of each. Man who could not keep from eating from the one restricted tree was kept from eating from the other one, the tree of life. Had he been eating from the tree of life, he would have lived in that condition forever. We have now gone through the whole cycle, from the beginning to the end, to a new beginning without end, and here again, the same tree of life is seen in the new city. John tells us three things about this tree of life. First, its location, because the word tree is singular, some people assume that there will be only one tree. John is talking about a kind of tree. There will be only one kind of tree like this. Later in the verse, John says, each tree yielding its fruit. He's not saying that there will be only one tree for everybody, billions of people. Can you imagine the line to get to that tree? There will be no lines in heaven, I'm sure. It would not be heaven if there would be long lines. Remember Exodus 18, 
God did not like it when Moses made the people wait in line. He said, appoint 70 people, divide the work, no long lines. I believe long lines are from the devil. <laughs> so John mentioned two locations where that kind of tree will be found. Location number one is in the middle of the street. That's weird. We saw last week in chapter 21, verse 21, that the street will be pure gold, like transparent glass. Obviously, there will be no cars there. Maybe some golf carts. That'd be cool. I like golf carts. But there will be a tree there. And then another location says, on either side of the river. Again, that does not mean only one tree on each side. But there will be that type of tree on each side of the river. After this location, we have its production. John tells us that this type of tree produces 12 different fruits. Each tree will yield its fruit each month. What does it mean? It means one of two things. Either 12 different kind of tree will grow at one time on that tree coming back every month. Or one kind of fruit will grow in each tree each month, bringing a different fruit in each tree every month for 12 months. So one month, apple, another month, peaches, another month, pear. I prefer the first one with 12 different fruit. That's nice selection. But either 12 fruit per tree or one fruit per tree per month. Either way, it will be a double abnormality from what we are accustomed to today. Today, each tree produces only one kind of fruit all of its life and produces them only in its season. Here, each tree will produce different kinds of fruits or will produce one kind of fruit 12 times a year. It was not so from the beginning. In Genesis 1:11. We read that each fruit tree was to produce fruit according to its kind. Even though the name is the same in Genesis 1 and in Revelation 22, tree of life, Adam did not see this kind of tree of life. And he will like that very different. Early in Revelation chapter 2, verse 7, the saints were promised. Promised what? The right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. That was the promise. So the promise is fulfilled here in Revelation 22. After its location and its production, we have its intention. What's the purpose for it? It is twofold. Number one, it is for food. Number two, it is for medicine. Its fruit will be for food and its leaves will be for medicine. This tree will have a special power in its leaves to heal the nation. But it does not refer to disease or suffering, or pain. Why not? Because we saw chapter 21, verse 4, there will be none of that anymore. What then? It refers to prolongation of life. The leaves will be for prolongation of life. The fruit of the tree will make the leaves of the tree will make people live long. 
going back to the Garden of Eden. In Genesis 2 and 3, we see that God made different trees. Some trees were for food, Genesis 2.16, and there was the tree of life in Genesis 3.22 for medicine or for, uh, to reju uh, rejuvenate and live forever. That was the purpose of the tree of life. You would eat of this, you, eat for, you live forever. In our new residence, the same tree, the tree of life, will do the same thing. It says medicine, but the fruit will be food, the leaves will be medicine, and the word healing here means health giving. Our English word therapeutic comes from that Greek word. Even though there will be no sickness in the eternal state, the fruit and the leaves of the tree will contribute to the physical well-being of those in the eternal state. If this tree of life is going to rejuvenate people, I am sure the women are going to hang out by that tree. Bill, where's your wife? Hey, she's by the tree of life, man. Rejuvenating. In the Garden of Eden, there was also the tree of knowledge of good and evil, which in reality was the tree of death. A tree of life and a tree of death. Adam was granted the privilege of eating from the tree of life and any other trees in the garden. But he was prohibited from eating from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, the tree of death. God did not want him to do that. God did not want him to die. And yet Abraham chose to eat from that forbidden tree, the tree of death, over the tree of life. Rather than obey God, and temporarily lose his woman. He chose to disobey God in order to keep his woman. But once sin entered in, the race could no longer be trusted with the tree of life. That's when Adam and Eve were kicked out and they bar entrance to the garden. It is hard for us to understand why Adam would choose the tree of death over the tree of life. Had he decided to obey God, Eve would have died, and he would have been given another wife. It would not have been harder for God to make another woman. Adam had plenty of ribs. What's another rib? <laughs> but Adam was in love. Romeo and Juliet, nothing new. He was in love with a woman he hardly knew. A woman who tripped him. Indeed, love is blind. The interesting thing is that God gives everybody today the exact same choice as he give him the tree of life or the tree of death? We choose. The tree of life is the cross of Jesus Christ. It brings life through his death. People are invited to partake of the tree of life in order to receive the benefit of the cross, which is eternal life. The tree of death is the rejection of the sacrifice on the cross, the rejection of Christ, and the rejection of his payment for our sin. Every human being today has the very same choice to make that Adam made. And that's why some people will have to make that choice. That's why Satan will be released so that they have to make a choice. 
everyone setting foot on earth as a choice to make. Either partake of the tree of life, receive Jesus Christ and live forever, or partake of the tree of death, reject Jesus Christ and die. The choice is plain and simple. John goes on with verse 3. And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. They shall see his face, and his name shall be on their foreheads, and there shall be no night there. They need no lamp, no light of the sun, for the Lord God gives them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. As if to remind the readers that the healing as such will not be necessary, John added that there shall be no more curse. Why not? Because there will be no more sin. Curse come from sin. You eliminate sin, there is no more curse. As the curse of Adam's sin led to illnesses, require healing, and even led to death, so in the eternal state, there will be no curse. Therefore, no healing of illnesses will be necessary. Today, the earth is still under the curse of sin. But then, it will not be. In Genesis chapter 3, Adam and Eve, after they had disobeyed, God pronounced curses and consequences on their action. There were five curses for each party involved in the disobedience. God started with a serpent. To the serpent... He said, you are cursed more than all the cattle. You're going to have a hard, cold life, worse than the cattle in the field. Number two, you shall be cursed more than any beast. You'll be in worse shape than any of them. And he gets more and more detail. Number three, on your belly you shall go. God either remove its leg or its wings or both. The curse was, you're going on your belly. Number four, you shall eat dust. You will crawl on the ground with your face in the dust. And number five, the seed of the woman shall bruise your head. You will be defeated by the seed that will come from the woman. That is to the serpent. Then he turned to the woman and he said to her, I will increase your sorrow. Most likely, you will be more emotional and you will have a difficult life. Increased sorrow. Number two, I will increase your conception. So either increase the time for the baby to nine months, that could have been two or three months. Number three, in pain you shall bring four children. It could have been easy. Could have been an in and out burger. Boom, the kid is out. Praise the Lord. Painless. So no, in pain you will have children. Number four, your desire shall be for your husband. What desire? Desire to change him. Desire to control him. But God don't stop there. But, number five, he shall rule over you. He will be the head of household. He will be the spiritual leader, not you. That's part of the curse. Cannot be changed. That is back in Genesis. You cannot change that today because we're a nicer, smarter society. Cannot be changed. In the garden, Eve tried to change her husband and control him. Honey, 
taste of this pleasant and desirable fruit. I heard it will make you wise. Adam was not too sure. He just did not want to lose the wife. And he submitted to her. Exactly the opposite as God said, you will be the head of our soul. She will submit to you. He submitted to her as so many today. Then to the, to the man, God said, because it was crystal clear, because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree. That's the reason for the five curses. Number one, curse is a ground for your sake. The ground won't be good to you. In toil, you will eat. It won't be easy to feed yourself. No toil, no eat. Thorns and thistles will grow for you. Dangerous and useless things will grow instead of good vegetables. Number four, in the sweat of your face, you shall eat bread. You will have to work hard and sweat. And number five, dust you are, dust you shall return. You're going to become frail and frail and frailer, and you're going to die. The sad part is that all three parties involved here are still fighting God. The serpent is still trying to defeat God and not be defeated by the seed of the woman. He's still fighting this. The women are still fighting, trying not to let their husband be the head of our soul, be the spiritual leader, not be ruled by them as God said. There is a new style of partnership between a husband and a wife that did not exist when I was a kid. It is called the 50-50 partnership. Regardless of who works where or how long, it is expected of both parties, the husband and the wife, to share equally 50-50 in the duties of the home. And they count, and they keep track of the percentages that each person puts in. They have to be fair. And they believe that it is the answer to a happy marriage, but it is not. Couples with that type of legalistic partnership are unhappy. They fight over one doing more or doing less than the other, and they end up divorcing anyway. The Bible says, do everything as unto the Lord. Do not count. It is for the Lord. Do as much as you can. Do not worry about what the other person is doing. You're doing it for the Lord. Not happening anymore. There is also a new type of spiritual leadership in Christian homes today. This one is very popular. It is called co-leadership. The husband and the wife are co-leaders in the home. You have two spiritual leaders. No one will take the lead alone. No one will make a decision alone, regardless of what it is, without getting the co-approval of the other. They decide together. They rule together. It may sound good, it may sound fair, it may sound up to date, but it is totally contrary to God. This is exactly what Eve, the first wife, tried to do. She sort of discovered something new. She heard something new from the devil. She was sold on the idea of 
trying the forbidden tree. So she went to Adam, and they discussed it together. She helped him to make a decision, and they kind of made the decision together. But it was not what God intended for them. Adam alone was to make that decision as the spiritual leader, not her and not with her. This is something that's very popular today. You go to a Christian home, there is no spiritual leader. There's a pair, there's two of them, there's a co-leadership, and that is not of God. It may sound good, you may like it, it may keep the wife happy. God is not happy with it. This is not his intention for a man and a woman together. I'm going to be crucified at the door today. <laughs> and now the men, the men are not any better. They are trying to fight God's curse. They do not want to work hard. Forget the sweat. They buy lottery tickets trying to get rich quick. Some commit crimes so that they will not have to work hard to eat bread, like God said. As a result, they are totally unhappy. It is not possible to fight God and be happy. Unhappiness in the home often comes from refusing to accept what God has ordained. God said it, we do it. So there will be no more curse on the ground, no more curse on the woman, there will be no more curse on the man, there will be no more curse on the animal kingdom. We ran the full cycle. Genesis brought the beginning of the curse. Revelation brings the end of the curse. The Old Testament closed with the word curse. Malachi 4, 6. The New Testament announces the removal of the curse. John also says that God's servant shall serve him. This is the answer to the question that many people ask, what will we do in heaven? Now you won't be sitting on a cloud playing the harps. We will serve God. The highest joy and privilege of the saints in eternity will be to serve their blessed Lord. Even though it is true that we will also reign with him. Those not accustomed to serve God here will have a hard time there. Service starts here. This is where we prepare. This is where we practice. This is where we learn. We're not yet on vacation. Now, because the church has abused people in the past and made them work for their salvation, there seemed to be a complete reversal of attitude. People today do not want to do anything for the Lord. As a result, you have a minority that is overworked, and then the body of Christ suffers. The few who are serving get discouraged because of the lack of help. We should all serve God because it is the will of God for us. If you are doing absolutely nothing for God because you do not know what you can or cannot do for him, talk to me. I will assign a ministry for you to help or even to pray for that ministry. I may assign to you a family that is in a mission field in Russia or in the Philippines, and you can pray for them every day. You can get their email address, and you can communicate. You can be intercessors for God, but do not be cats caught up by doing nothing for God. Do something, anything. Pray for people. Call them on the phone, anything. 
John mentioned two things about the servants of God in verse 4. Not only would they serve God, but they will see his face. In the Sermon of the Mount, Matthew 5, 8, Jesus promised that the pure in heart will see God. So servants of God are pure in heart, and they will see God. Second thing he says, his name, God's name will be on their forehead, on the servants. Who else will have God's name on their forehead? Remember Revelation chapter 14? The 144,000 Jews who were serving God. <laughs> what did Jesus promise to the overcomers in the church of Philadelphia? Revelation 3.12. I will write on him the name of my God, Jesus said. So God's servants will serve him. They will see his face. They will have God's name on their forehead. There is another weird characteristic about the city in verse 5. There shall be no night there. We saw this already in chapter 21, verse 25. It means that there will be no need to sleep, to recharge. Our new bodies will be totally different than the ones that we have now. We will be able to see God's face and stay up all night just like teenagers. There will be no need for lamps, for lights, even for the sun, because the Lord himself will illuminate everything. There will be no darkness except one place where the lake of fire will be. Jesus said that Gehenna will be total darkness. A final thing is said about the servants of God. They shall reign forever and ever. The Greek simply says always and always and always. How long is that? It will be an eternal reign. Hard to understand something that is forever and ever, but it will be. We cannot understand eternity. John ends the section, he says in verse 6, Then he said to me, These words are faithful and true. And the Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angels to show his servants the things which must shortly take place. Behold, I am coming quickly. Blessed is he who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. Who made that statement? To John, verse 6, same angel, one of the seven angels who had the last seven bowls of judgment. This is the third time we see a statement being repeated. These words are faithful and true. Three times. First time was in chapter 19 about the marriage supper of the Lamb. And then in chapter 21, about the new city coming down from heaven. Then we see it here in chapter 22, verse 6, about seeing God's face and remaining with him forever and ever. Every time we read about something that is incredible, something that is hard to believe, God comes up with that statement, these words are faithful and true, to confirm that these are the true sayings of God. The other statement, the things which must shortly take place. We have seen that at the very beginning of the book, Revelation 1.1. The book was written many years earlier. It does not mean that God is procrastinating. The Greek word is weird, is tacos, T-A-C-H-O-S, not the Mexican food. It means hastily, quickly, speedily signifying that when it starts, look out, it will roll fast. Then verse 7 is a statement that is made by Jesus himself. It's read in. Seven times in this book, Jesus said that, Behold, I am coming quickly. Seven times he said this. Three times he said it to the churches in chapters 2 and 3 of Revelation. He said it once after the sixth bowl in chapter 16, verse 15. 
He said it here, chapter 22, verse 7. He will say it again, chapter 22, verse 12, and one last time in chapter 22, verse 20. It must be very important for him to say it seven times. He is not kidding. He is coming quickly. Now, many people are bothered by this declaration of Jesus. He said that he is coming quickly. It's been over 2,000 years. We must remember that God is outside of time. For him, 1,000 years is like one day, and one day is like 1,000 years. So when he said that he was coming quickly to him, that's only a few days. In the book of Hosea, I know you read it all the time, there is a very interesting prophecy about that. Hosea chapter 6 verse 2 says, and I quote, After two days he, God, will revive us, and on the third day he will raise us up that we may live in his sight. In other words, after 2,000 years he will revive us, revive us, and on the 3,000th year, he will raise us up that we may live in his sight. Beautiful prophecy. What is the reason for God's delay? One thing, love is not willing that any shall perish, but that all should come to repentance and be with him. That is why he did not come yet. He knows that more people will accept his plan of salvation and will end up with him in heaven. There is another, another blessing, another beatitude, if you will, in verse 7. Blessed is he who keeps the words of this prophecy of this book. The book of Revelation is called a prophecy. Four times in this chapter, verse 7, verse 10, verse 18, verse 19. The book starts with a blessing, chapter 1, verse 3, and it ends with a blessing, chapter 22, verse 7, and the blessing is the same at both places. In chapter 1, the blessing is to those who hear and keep the words of this prophecy. Here in chapter 22, the blessing is to those who keep the words of this prophecy of this book. The blessing is not to those who know, not to those who hear, but to those who keep the words of this prophecy. The key word is keep. It is sad that so many pastors will not teach this book of Revelation. Yet at the beginning of the book, at the end of the book, there is a special blessing. This is the only book in the Bible with a blessing. So in our text today, we see the place where we are going to be. What a place. It excludes night, lamps, sun, darkness, death, sorrow, crying, pain. Most of all, it excludes sinners, it excludes sin, it excludes curses. It includes a pure river of water, the tree of life, the throne of God and of the Lamb. It includes serving God, seeing his face, having his name on our forehead, remaining with him forever and ever. Heaven is not only the absence of evil, it is the privilege of serving God in his presence and reigning with him forever and ever. Finally, we understand why God created us. This morning in our text, we were allowed to see inside the new city and see the river of life, see the tree of life. We see the plan that God had for us at the very beginning of time. Had Adam and Eve not rebelled against God, they would have had that kind of life and they would have lived and we would have lived like this. From the beginning, one last thing, the city, the river, the tree of life, all these new things are not for everybody. They are not for anybody. These things are only for believers, for those who believe in Jesus Christ, for those who have accepted him 
and made him their Lord and Savior. Those who have not will never see this city. They will never see this river. They will never see this tree of life. They are lost. They will go to eternal darkness and torment. It might not have taken long after the world was created for sin to enter the world, for this world to be cursed. It might have taken a long time to get rid of the curse, over 6,000 years. But we have the guarantee in our text today that it will be done. We see here that finally the curse is gone. Now we understand a little bit better why certain things happen in this world. Why is this place so terrible? It is cursed. The world where we live has been cursed by God. We live in a cursed world. You wonder where cancer comes from. Come from the curse. It will not be there in the new world. That's why God is not going to modify this earth, change it a little bit. He will destroy it completely. Peter said he's going to melt it away. It has been cursed. We're living in a cursed world. And if it would not be of God, I don't know how we could live here. It's getting worse and worse. We need him more and more. But that's the reason why this world is so wicked and so terrible, because it has been cursed by sin, and we need out of it. We need to be with the Lord. God has made a plan for us. He's shown us the plan he had. He's shown us the place that he has for us. It is just a matter of time. The next great news on all the networks will be that a bunch of people have disappeared from the face of the earth. The rapture of the church is the next big thing coming. Be ready for it. Be ready to be out of this cursed world and be with the Lord. Be in the new city, a new world, new Jerusalem. It would be a great place. That's what should keep you going. Not the amount of interest you're earning in your saving or your CD. What should keep you going is the place in heaven that God has for you. Do not jeopardize that. May the Lord be with you. May the Lord bless each and every one of you. May he bless your life. May he help you to live godly in this cursed world. May he protect you, watch over you, and bring you safely home where you belong in heaven with him. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.